Welcome, everyone, to the March 14 City Council meeting. Welcome to everybody who's come tonight to be with us and those at home. And uh, the first thing we have on our agenda, each meeting is a public forum. Public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the City Council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person has three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residence, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. And we have 20 people signed up, and just so the council knows, a great many of them are about goats. Goats. You're going to be educated tonight. So, but the first one is not. <laughs> uh, Deb Frissel is up first, and then Jeannie Harden is next. About 10 years ago, there was an article in the New York Times about mad cow disease. An expert describing the federal government's approach to beef inspection used the phrase, don't look, don't find. I was reminded of this when reading about the Eugene City Council's approach to the catastrophic budget deficit facing the 4J school district. It seems to me the phrase, don't try, don't succeed, describes your approach. You tabled the option of a restaurant tax. Tabled restaurant tax, that's funny. Prior to the public hearing and prior to paying UO economics professor Ed Whitelaw and Eco Northwest to do an analysis. It's perverse to eliminate all but one option prior to paying for an analysis and seeking public input. Moreover, it's clear that a restaurant tax is superior to an income tax in at least four ways. The first benefit of a restaurant tax over an income tax is that Eugene residents get more bang for their buck because of the larger tax base that includes many non-residents who visit Eugene for Ducks games, Elton John concerts, or Jeff, Jeff Dunham shows. The second, ben the second benefit is more bang for the buck because of more compliance due to point of purchase collection. The third benefit is lower administrative costs. You don't have to reinvent the IRS. The fourth benefit is that it's much more likely to be approved by the voters. A restaurant tax feels discretionary, while an income tax is not avoidable. Some people might think the fact that PERS beneficiaries are not exempt from the restaurant tax is a fifth benefit. It looks like you don't want a tax, and so you eliminated from the get-go the tax that had a chance of being approved by the voters. When the income tax is rejected, you guys can say, hey, we tried. But in fact, you're really guilty of the don't try, don't succeed approach. It seems to me that education is a civil rights issue. Therefore, your perverse, pathological, duplicitous hostility toward K through 12 students can be viewed as deliberate indifference to their civil rights. What schools would Martin Luther King Jr. close? What schools would Jesus close for that matter? I can imagine a class action suit, a class project in schools across town. Students write tort claim notices to the Eugene City Council the Torts for Tots project. Dear city councilors, please consider this your 180-day notice as required by Oregon Revised Statutes that I intend to name you as a defendant in a civil suit in the United States District Court of Oregon for your decision on January whatever 2011 to remove the restaurant tax from consideration, thus all but guaranteeing catastrophic 4J budget cuts that will decrease the quality of my already substandard education. Hundreds of letters will be written in burnt sienna Crayola crayon, and they'll be delivered to the Eugene City Hall. There will be t-shirts that say torts for tots on the front, and on the back it will say education is a civil rights issue. Thank you. Uh, Jeannie Harden's next, followed by Robin Chappelle. Good evening, City Council members, and thank you for hearing me. My name is Jeannie Harden, and I live just outside the Eugene city limits, south of town. I'm a Grange member, and my family has a small subsistence farm, including two Nigerian dwarf goats who will be bearing offspring soon and will then be able to be milked. A couple of months ago, I saw a notice in Ruminations magazine, which is dedicated to Nigerian dwarf goats, that Charlottesville, Virginia, joins the rank <clears throat> joins the ranks of Oakland, Seattle, Houston, and many other cities in allowing urban goat keeping. 
I became curious about Eugene and soon discovered from your own website that in early 2010, the Food Security Resource and Scoping Plan was submitted. I was thrilled with the embedded document by U of O law professor Mary Wood. The paper is called The White Paper on Urban Homesteading and Model Ordinance. If you haven't read it yet, I highly suggest it. I then put the word out to the Friendly Street Farmers, a group I knew who was already involved in urban agriculture and discovered quite a few interested city residents. Then in January, a couple, a couple of us went to a planning commission meeting to let them know that we supported the food security resource scoping plan and that we would like to see the planning commission address micro livestock issues by forming a working committee to this end. Katya Kohler, her family and I, then met with Councilman George Brown, who represents that particular ward. Councilman Brown encouraged us to help support the city's food security plan by educating you, the council, on the issues of goats, mini goats, and urban goat keeping. To that end, we've gathered here tonight to provide you with some perspectives from our community. Please keep in mind this evening as you listen to testimony that urban homesteading is not just a hobby or even a way to simply improve our individual diets, although of course it does. It's not just fun, although it's that too. Our overall aim is to create a food production system that will eventually replace the one we currently use, which is inhumane, inefficient, and squanders our Earth's precious resources to a perilous degree. Please compare the concerns that come up with the local food system to the concerns of the industrialized system, including the public cost of infectious diseases generated by concentrated animal feedlot operations or the ocean die-offs due to agricultural runoff from our rivers, the necessity to feed cattle with soy grown from the Amazon jungle, where the <coughs> soy grown where the Amazon jungle once stood, and our dependence on fossil fuels, coal burning, and possibly even nuclear. Tonight we gather together here to ask the City of Eugene to form a working committee to begin implementation of the Food Security Plan as soon as it is possibly feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Chappelle is next, followed by it's like Zoe Howe. Good evening. Citizen number 302-71. Uh, I've been in Eugene a long time and uh, the gas prices are going up here like everywhere else, so I'm speaking to the goat issue, but um, by considering the most sustainable way of living possible, and I think um, now is the time that Eugene be a leader in our nation to consider the most sustainable living practices possible, and I think goats are part of this um, because we need food sources that are close to the city, if not in the city. So I'd just like you to give your consideration to fact that we need to uh, live and eat close to home. Go goats. Thank you. So how, if I pronounce that correctly, and Krista Niddle is after her. Um, I wrote this letter to Mayor Piercy in December. Could you give your name, please? My name is Zoe, Ho is Zoe Hoff. Okay. Um, I wrote this letter to Mayor Piercy in December about allowing goats in Eugene, I would like to share it with you. Dear Mayor Piercy, I am writing this letter because I would like you to allow small goats within city limits of Eugene. I am ten and a half years old. I live on the outskirts of Eugene on a little farm. Some people don't want goats in the city because they think they're stinky, loud, ugly, and big. I don't agree. Only unneutered males are stinky. I have one full-size La Mancha I, and Overhousies and a Toggenberg. All my goats are very quiet. They only make noise when they are in distress. They are not ugly, but adorably cute. My full-sized goats are only as big as my Airedale, and my mini goats are much smaller than her. All of our goats are smaller than our one-and-a-half-year-old Great Pyrenees. Dog-like Great Pyrenees are allowed to live in the city, even in apartment buildings. However, goats who are much smaller are not allowed in the city. Many people want Eugene to be a sustainable city. Well, goats can help. They can mow lawns without fossil fuel. There are lots of alleyways with overgrown blackberries and weeds. Goats especially love blackberries. When they do produce sweet milk, you can drink it or make it into cheese, ice cream, yogurt, and other dairy products. You can use the manure in backyard gardens. Goats can also be taught to walk on a leash like a dog. Goats have taught me many lessons. I have learned responsibilities such as feeding and watering them twice a day, milking them twice a day, 
cleaning up their pens and learning about their health care. It is also very exciting to watch new lives begin. I get to see all of our baby goats being born this past year. I also have made hard choices about the babies, like who I was going to keep. I will carry what I have learned from taking care of my goats throughout my life. I hope you allow goats in the city so others can, can learn. Sincerely, Zoe Hoff. I also have some pictures of my goats and my dog and me about the, in the sizes. Give them to Please, we don't, we don't clap in here, but thank you. Let's, uh, Kristen Niddle is next, followed by Bill Basic. Hello, I'm Kristen Niddle, and I live in West Eugene. I have two chickens, and I'm looking forward to getting two Nigerian mini goats in the future because I know they make good pets, and they make as much sense to me as having a dog. In fact, in some ways, they're superior to a dog because they produce milk and manure that I can use in my garden. And they're affectionate, intelligent, and trainable, and not destructive as long as there's adequate shelter and fencing. And I think they should be licensed just as dogs are. And all of their requirements are available within the city limits. They need um, food and straw bedding and mineral a mineral block, and that's all available in the city. Thank you. Bill Basic is next, followed by Chris Delmonley. Mayor, City Council, my name is Bill Bazook, and I'm the owner of the Eugene Backyard Farmer. It's the urban farming store located at the corner of 5th and Washington, which I believe is in the 7th uh, Ward. Um, and as the town's only urban farming supply store, I think I have a unique perspective in terms of what's going on in the backyard farming movement. I'd like to share just a couple of observations, if I might. Uh, first of all, the urban farmer is both very diverse and very mainstream. Uh, my customer base is coming from all apparent income levels, most definitely all ages, and absolutely all neighborhoods. Um, it's really quite funny to look out into my parking lot and see a beat-up old Subaru next to a brand new Mercedes-Benz. Trust me, it happens all the time. <laughs> Second, the urban farmer does their research, and this is a very uh, responsible lot. Um, the last time I spoke with you was in regards to the chicken ordinance. Um, I'm astounded on a daily basis how much research my customers do before they come into my store to purchase their chicks. And for um, those people who are not well prepared, education is key in my store. As a matter of fact, I teach uh, classes on how to raise backyard chickens, and I've teach, taught four classes so far. They've all been four, sold out, and a couple of times after class, people have come up to me and said, you know what, I'm not sure if I'm ready for chickens right yet. And um, for me, obviously, that's a bad thing because I just lost a sale. But ultimately, for the backyard farming movement, it's a good thing because the alternative is for people to get into something that they're not fully researched and prepared to do, and then they let their chickens go free. And I assure you that that's... I want that as much as you do. If I wanted to move to a city that uh, was overrun with chickens, I'd move to Miami or Maui or Key West. Um, I want you to know that the people who love their backyard and farms, they are starting to ask about other aspects of biodiversity, which includes goats. And once again, I want to reinforce the fact that this is a very diverse group that's asking for goats. And finally, just because people are interested in gardens and goats, or gardens and chickens, doesn't mean that they're automatically going to want to get goats. The percentage of my customers who want goats is not all that large, honestly. But people are starting to look at their backyards as what we call a biodynamic landscape. And uh, they want to consider goats as a viable option for food source and food security. Myself, I love my garden. I love my chickens. But I still have to work on my orchard, and I have to get my bees up and running. I'm not even close to getting ready for goats yet. <laughs> but I have many customers who are looking for that. And essentially, that's my perspective as a business owner in terms of backyard farming. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Christelle Manali is next, followed by Alexander Rempel. My name is Christelle Munley, and I live in Eugene. Um, I am a soap maker in town, and one of my key ingredients is goat's milk. I try to run my business as sustainably as possible, and I rely on local resources to make an environmentally friendly product. If there were people in town who had goats, I could get my raw materials and make soap and pick the things up I needed by bicycle. Even better, I hope to even be able to have goats in my own backyard to help me make a truly sustainable product. Thank you. Next is Alexandra Rempel, followed by Cam Fox. Hi, I'm Alexandra Rempel. I'm a building scientist at SolarC Architecture and Engineering here in town. And I've been looking into municipal and land use codes that affect miniature goats. 
um, in cities that are allowing miniature goats in residential areas. So these cities are comparable to Eugene in their philosophy towards individual freedoms, but also have more urban area than we do. So I think we have quite a lot to learn from the solutions they've come up to um, to regulate both nuisance and then public health and safety factors while allowing people to have miniature goats in smaller residential lots. So all of these codes do have strict provisions to protect the neighbors and the public health and also the health and safety of the animals themselves, either in the specific goat provisions or in more general areas of the code. So where they differ is in the lot size needed before goats are permitted in the first place. So currently in Eugene's code, um, goats are considered farm animals. They are allowed in R1 zones, but the lot has to be at least 20,000 square feet or about half an acre. In Seattle, um, which is the most similar code to Eugene's and also one of the best worded, I think, miniature goats um, have their own category of small animals where they're put together with miniature pigs. And up to three miniature goats are allowed on an R1 lot of any size as long as they're neutered and dehorned. And so section F, I'll give these to you afterwards, of miniature goats um, reads, the types of goats commonly known as pygmy, dwarf, and miniature goats may be kept as small animals provided that male miniature goats are neutered and all miniature goats are dehorned. Nursing offspring of miniature goats um, may be kept until weaned no longer than 12 weeks from birth. So that's one of the, one of the clearest ones. Then Vancouver, Washington, takes a similar approach except regulating the animals by weight rather than type. Um, goats, miniature goats, then fall into the category of miniature livestock under 100 pounds, and again, up to three are allowed in a residential lot of any size. Um, Berkeley and Charlottesville, Virginia, both regulate goats independently of all other animals. In Berkeley, two goats of any size are allowed. Um, also, males are neutered and they must be dehorned. Um, and then in Charlottesville, three miniature goats are allowed. And finally, Portland has the most complicated but possibly the best meaning code. Um, they try to regulate just the noise, odor, and nuisance factors without regard to animal number, type, or size. So they end up with a very complicated <laughs> arrangement in which you can have up to three individuals of chickens, rabbits, or goats. Above three total individuals, then you have to apply for an animal facility permit, which induces fees and inspections and things. So I'll give this to you. I don't necessarily recommend it. Um, but, but basically, the, the take home message is that a number of cities have come up with different flexible ways to accommodate urban goats. And um, they'll provide good precedence for the Eugene Working Group when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Cam Fox is next, followed by Marshall Gauss. Hi, my name is Cam Fox. I'm here to talk about goats. Now, you're, now let's think of it this. We're allowed dogs in an apartment, yet we're not allowed goats in a half acre plot. Now, and, and also dogs make more noise. I mean, goats sometimes bleed and stuff. And frankly, goats are just a lot more efficient. They eat, they eat the grass, then they poop, and, and then they breed, and you can have babies, except we don't really want that many goats, so we're probably going to sell them. And then you can get milk. Now, th but you have to breed them every two years, but anyway. And so, dogs, you don't get anything out of them. Not that many people milk dogs. Well, maybe some people do. And... And I don't know if anyone in here eats dogs, but I've heard of it. But you can do both those things with goats, even though that I'm not willing to eat my pet. Well, so I don't get it why you don't allow goats <laughs> if you allow dogs and cats in an apartment. <laughs> thank you, my, thank you. <laughs> I had to restrain myself. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that was great. Sorry, Thanks so much. My name is Marshall Gauze. I live in Ward 1. Um, I'm here as well to talk about the issue of goats. I was here before you several months ago and spoke about chickens. Um, we've moved on now. So, uh, Goats are a very important part of a sustainable um, living system. Um, they're, uh, as many people have mentioned, they're allowed in cities including Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, Austin, Texas, 
and they really are independent of the other ca categories of livestock. Um, they can provide up to a, between one and eight pounds of milk per day. We've actually witnessed a, you know, a two-minute feeding that, that provided half of a gallon of milk. Um, and some of the smaller breeds, obviously, um, can be walked. They can, they're very trainable. They're very friendly. Um, there's a breed that actually was developed in Oregon City called the Pygora goat, which is a cross between a pygmy and an angora. Um, they're grown for fiber. We've actually seen some of those in Portland in a very dense urban area that are kept and their fibers used for, for spinning crafts and that sort of thing. Um, and as most people have mentioned, the, the lot requirement right now requires a 20,000 square foot space to keep a goat. So this really makes it an issue to some degree of, of, of food justice because you simply have to be able to afford enough space to have a goat when the reality is the people that probably would most benefit from it are living in a much smaller space. Um, and not having a goat contributes to having to sort of feed the, the uh, industrial food chain, requiring you to go to the store, buy things, things that are refrigerated. A lot of that you can get from your backyard for just the cost of burning calories. Um, so we've gotten a lot of people in, um, involved and excited about this issue. I've been really, really uh, pleased with how many people have been, been very, very excited and enthusiastic. We started a group called Eugene Urban Goats. Um, we started a Facebook page. We have over 100 followers. And in our process, we went around and collected some signatures. We started an online petition as well. And we have here, I'll submit these to the record, over 150, 152 signatures from people in all different parts of Eugene, all different wards, as well as the signatures from um, our petition online for people supporting the issue. And what we request is that the city move to change the code as soon as possible. In the interim, they could freeze the code, freeze enforcement, because it's a separate issue. Um, it wouldn't have to touch any of the other parts of the code. But we ask that you change it so that people in normal size urban lots can keep goats in their backyard. Thank you. Thank you. Sage Fox is next, followed by Katya Kohler. Hi, my name is Sage Fox, and uh, I'm from Eugene and I'm 13 years old, and I'm here tonight to ask the city to allow goats within the city limit uh, because, of their, um, because of their milk. And goats um, are an outstanding source of milk due to their capability of producing one quart of milk per goat per day, um, which is with two goats enough to produce probably enough milk for a family. And um, right now, people buy their milk usually from supermarkets or stores in either glass, plastic, or just cardboard with a plastic lining. And not only is, in the case of the cardboard with plastic lining, is it un unhealthy, but it's also a huge waste of natural resources, and it takes a ton of carbon to transport the milk from wherever it's produced, factory or farm, to the consumers. And um, with goats, it just comes from your backyard. No waste and uh, no fossil fuel emissions needed. Also, the goat milk, the quality of goat milk is superior, or any milk from your backyard, to that that comes from far away. Um, because of the way they're raised on a lot you can control the way they're fed and all of the elements and uh, you don't know what they've been fed and all that when it comes from far away so thank you thank you next is Katya Kohler followed by Mary Wood hi um I'm Katya Kohler, and I um, live in George Brown's district. Uh, we currently live on an 8,000-square-foot lot in Eugene. Our house is 1,000 square feet. We would like to devote a large part of our backyard, minus our vegetable garden, to two small milking goats. Before we build a proper pen and goat shed, we want to make sure that goats will be legalized in Eugene. So I'm here today to encourage the ordinance to be changed soon or to freeze enforcement of the code. My sons want um, can't digest pasteurized milk, but they can dry, um, drink raw milk, and I'd like to have my own goats so we can get good nutritious milk from them to drink. Uh, we already buy organic alfalfa for our chickens from a local farmer and local and organic grains from Bill Bazook's backyard farmer. 
We can feed this to our goats, plus blackberry cuttings from the alleys in our neighborhood. Leaves off our maple trees and fir trees and bamboo and dandelions, as well as a number of other weeds and bushes that grow in our alleys. As part of a preparation for our goats, we also wanted to meet um, other goat owners that live in a city. So we contacted goat owners in Seattle and Portland. We visited a few in Portland, like Kenya Spiegel and Seth Brown. And they live in, a heart, in the heart of Portland and have three small goats in a pen 400 square feet in size. They get food for their goats from local farmers, and they love that they can milk their own goats and know exactly what they feed them. They also love that they have not had to use antibiotics or conventional dewormers on them, and that if their goats get ill, they only use herbal remedies. And um, I want this kind of control over the food I give my children. I've worked on um, a goat farm in Texas, milking goats and witness owners once pour milk in with pus from mastitis and sell this to their customers. Um, they also use pesticides for fly control, and these farmers advertise their products as natural and pesticide-free food. Unfortunately, the demands of farming can sometimes have a negative impact on the quality of our food. We also visited Krista and David Arias in Portland. They own urban farm bed and breakfast, an, an urban farm bed and breakfast, and have chickens and ducks, as well as um, three goats. The chickens help keep the fly population down. Uh, we watched David milk his goats and get half a gallon of milk in one milking. That means a gallon a day. Um, he likes that they can make their own yogurt and cheese, and their goats are in, smaller, in a smaller pen than Kenya's, but they graze them on a neighbor's lot a couple of times a week and take them on hikes. They also get all their food from, um, for their goats locally. So these are just a few of the many folks that own milking goats in cities even more densely populated than ours, um, as other people have mentioned. Um, we don't how have the financial ability to own a half an acre of land, which is what the city currently requires you to have for um, small goats even. But we can assure you that we will give our goats and chickens a better life than they would get on feedlots or other conventional farms. Thank you for Thank your time. Thank you. Mary Wood is next, followed by Cheryl Smith. Hello, I'm Mary Wood. I'm a professor of law at University of Oregon Law School with a hoarse voice. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm also director of the environmental law program there. And uh, I wanted to submit a white paper that our program did on the subject of reform of local land use laws to allow micro livestock on urban homesteads. And I have two copies in a moment to submit. Um, what we did was look at micro livestock regulation, including regulation of goats uh, throughout the country. And we approached it from a private property rights perspective. Um, we ended up creating a model ordinance that the city uh, staff has. And in it, we recommended that the city allow two pygmy goats. Um, and the details are in the ordinance. We found that cities are changing their land use ordinances because they have a new set of policy concerns. And cities are looking very hard at making their ordinances more flexible to allow a broader array of animals. Um, from the nuisance perspective, which is the background for all of these ordinances, um, you look at two inquiries. One is, is there substantial harm? And with goats, there really isn't, uh, in normal circumstances, <coughs> substantial harm. The perception of a farm animal does not count. Any adverse perception of a farm animal doesn't count as substantial harm. And goats really don't cause any more harmful effects generally than, say, dogs. Um, and then on the other side of the equation, you look at the social utility of the action. And there, um, the policy concerns of the city really come into play. The city's policy concerns have been stated in its food security plan and other sustainability documents as <clears throat> reducing fossil fuel dependence, um, increasing food security, um, uh, promoting local food production and so forth. So when you add all of that together in this equation, um, goats uh, have substantial benefits both for the private property owner who wants them, but also the city in furthering its land use policy as that has changed over time. Um, the city has in place already noise and smell protections ordinances that are very broadly worded. And so our recommendation, uh, the team that worked with me on this, came up with a recommendation for allowing pygmy goats, um, two female animals, and nursing offspring. 
um, they should be kept, shall be kept in a fenced yard or enclosure. And I would be available certainly to serve as any resource um, if you would like to inquire into this further. I do note that you would have a choice between, I suppose, a license requirement or not. Uh, we felt that it was not necessary and overly bureaucratic and that some cities do not have a license requirement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheryl Smith is next, followed by Ron Krasilnik. My name is Cheryl Smith. I'm from Cheshire. Um, I, for seven years, published Ruminations magazine, and I've raised miniature dairy goats since 98. I started with Nigerian dwarves, and then um, now I'm doing a crossbreed, which is still a miniature goat, and I produce them for milk. I wrote Goat, goat Health Care and Raising Goats for Dummies, <laughs> um, so I know a bit about goats. And so I, I want to reiterate some of the things that other speakers said, um, that goats don't stink. Their poop is pelleted. It's not like a cow. Um, the, a lot of the, the uh, credibility of, about their smell has to do with the bucks who do pee on themselves. And, you know, I wouldn't advocate that bucks live in the city anyway. They'd have to be neutered. Um, uh, you need 15 to 20 square foot indoors for one goat and 30 or more square feet outdoors. So that'd be 100 square feet if you were to have two miniature goats. I would uh, also contradict the prior speaker who advocated pygmy goats. Pygmy goats are fine for pets, but they're not normally milked, so they're not dairy goats. And so you'd probably want Nigerian dwarves or one of the mini dairy goats that are crossbreeds with the Nigerian dwarves. You need good fencing and shelter. You need a climbing area for your goats. Um, you need to remove poison plants and any other hazards in the yard. You need to protect your fruit trees. Uh, get rid of rhododendrons and azaleas that are poisonous and protect your rose bushes. So people need to be aware of that. They are relatively easy to care for. Um, you need to trim hooves every couple of months. You need to feed them regularly. And, you, of course, you have daily chores uh, where you're going to be cleaning up and replacing their bedding and that sort of thing. But I think that the people that are interested in this you generally start with chickens. I know I started with chickens, and you kind of learn that, and so you have daily chores with those as well. Uh, the minis make great milk and cheese, and um, as mentioned before, some of the minis also make fiber. Um, and the milk, they can be milked for years. If you're worried about extra babies being born all the time to have kids, I recently met a buyer who, uh, well, she was actually bringing her goat to get bread at my farm, and she had been milking that goat for 10 years. So you can go that long. Most people don't get, go that long, but you don't have to breed them every year. Um, the goat milk is more easily digested. You've probably all heard stories about so-and-so when they were a baby was raised on goat milk because they were allergic to everything else. And so it is known to be superior that way. Um, they're very easily trainable. They're very intelligent. You can take them on walks. Um, raising goats for dummies, I tell you about how to clicker train a goat. You can teach it to do tricks. They're very easily uh, leash trained. Um, and finally, they are quieter than many dogs. Um, I do admit I happen to have a couple loudmouth goats, but most of them, especially with Oberians, which is the breed that I breed, um, they're really quiet animals, and my dog is much Thank louder. Thank you very much. I think we have in a few more people, we got one more goat conversation coming up, but that person has to wait. Sorry, you're, I'm, we're now heading into Civic Stadium. So uh, Ron Crasel, thank you, is next, followed by Jonathan Brandt. Good evening. I'm Ron Krasilnik. I'm board president of Save Civic Stadium. I'm a resident of Ward 2, and as you said, I'm not going to talk about goats. I did want to thank the council, though, for addressing the issue of Civic Stadium. Um, and I look forward to attending your uh, work session on Wednesday. In the meantime, I invite you to visit our website, savecivicstadium.org, to learn more. And any additional information that you need, we would be happy to provide you with. A couple dozen of us have put our hearts, souls, time, and money into finding a new use for Civic Stadium. We are simply community volunteers acting on behalf of thousands of people who have a personal connection to this beloved community gathering spot. Save Civic, along with the City of Eugene, funded a study last year that discovered that professional soccer, a field house for year-round use by team and community groups and other activities, could revitalize Civic 
into a vibrant community sports and entertainment hub. Due to legal obstacles created as a result of the recent financial crisis, an investor group was unable to move the project forward. Now Save Civic has reconfigured the project to go forward on a nonprofit basis. The USL Soccer League wants a team in Eugene. A business plan has been prepared and almost $75,000 in pledges towards the initial costs of the project was raised in just two weeks. And we are meeting uh, with the Portland Timbers management Thursday of this week to discuss potential areas of collaboration. This project is laden with benefits for the community. But after all this, Civic Stadium's continued existence is in serious jeopardy. School District 4J staff has chosen not to forward our proposal to the board for consideration. The other proposals call for the stadium to be torn down for yet more student apartments or a big box retail store and parking lot. City Council has previously discussed the value of Civic Stadium and given indirect support to Save Civic while waiting for 4J's process to unfold. Now we know that despite paying only one dollar for the property and not maintaining it properly for years, 4J is views, viewing this historic property as a money-making opportunity rather than considering what its highest and best use is for the broader community. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Brandt is next, followed by Jim Watson. Uh, good evening. Jonathan Brandt, uh, Ward 1 with Civic Stadium. Uh, I'd like to mention three reasons why we think it's important to talk about Civic Stadium with you all tonight. First of all, uh, Save Civic has developed a viable plan uh, for the stadium, and there are many details to that, and we'd like to share that with you if you want to see our entire plan. Uh, we also feel that uh, the plan meets city goals, uh, stated city goals. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. It is also, our plan is also the highest and best use for the property. Uh, and finally, the council can help create a win-win in this situation for uh, various parties involved. So to start with, uh, let me talk about why the plan is viable. Uh, we've developed a business plan, and that is uh, being refined. We also have done a preliminary uh, funding plan. We're also uh, working with Abe Farkas, former Eugene Planning Director, who has assisted with the redevelopment of Portland Stadium to further develop the uh, funding plan for us. And our plan does not require city ownership of the property. Um, secondly, I'd like to talk about uh, why it's the proposal that we have is the highest and best use for the site. Only one of the proposals before the school district preserves and renews the stadium. And by the way, it is in sound shape, uh, uh, and so it has a real opportunity to, to uh, follow through with sustainability guidelines for the city. It's also our proposal is more appropriate for the neighborhood in terms of what uh, goes on there. A stadium on the historic register is more important than more retail apartments that can go anywhere uh, and other retail and apartments that can go anywhere. We provide more community-wide benefits than the other two proposals. And our plan is flexible and can include another partner such as the Y, which many people have suggested is a great combination. Uh, and as mentioned before, we're more in alignment with the stated city goals. And speaking of those, I want to enumerate uh, the goals that I've noticed that this meets. And those are goals for sustainability for the city, goals for historic preservation, goals for neighborhood livability, goals for economic development and jobs, and uh, goals for tourism. So um, a, a few more things about benefits for the community. We would have the opportunity to bring a professional sports team to the area. And you know that's not every day you have the opportunity. A lot of times cities are, are bidding against each other to get sports teams. But we have a unique opportunity now with Portland moving up to a higher level to bring that in. And many recreational benefits for people. You may have seen in the paper on Sunday an article about how successful the Portland soccer team is. I mean, soccer is hot in this country, in particular the Northwest. Um, I don't have too much time left, so I'd just like to thank you again for uh, putting a work session together on this timely topic. Uh, now is the time for action, though, to ensure that we still have this opportunity in the future. And we'd certainly be uh, happy to share more details with our plan for you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jim Watson is next, followed by Alan Beck. Thank you. I, too, want to thank you for um, scheduling the work session on Civic Stadium. I'm Jim Watson. I live at 2411 Monroe Street, uh, Ward 1. And um, um, I've been researching other communities that have um, ballpark situations like Eugene's, and there are some. 
Uh, one that's striking in its similarities is uh, Rickwood Field in, um, in Birmingham, Alabama. Rickwood was uh, built near downtown in 1910, and uh, it was a big success. It, is, it was a big success in uh, minor league baseball for uh, decades. Sound familiar? Um, when in 1988 a new ballpark was built out, outside of the core, the city core, um, Rickwood was in, in danger of being demolished. Um, a group called Friends of Rickwood came up with a plan to repurpose the stadium while retaining and highlighting its history. Civic Stadium right now is where Rick, Rickwood was 20 years ago. So what happened in Birmingham can act as a guide for us in Eugene, I think. In brief, by focusing on its strengths, the history, usability as a sports venue, and its location near downtown, all three of which we have here in Eugene with Civic Stadium, uh, Friends of Rickwood was able to raise funds from private, public, and grant resources to rehabilitate the stadium. The result is that Rickwood now thrives with income from attendance at sports and special events. Over the last 10 years, Rickwood has averaged 200 events a year and 220,000 visitors from out of town a year. Um, in the process, they've enhanced the town, the downtown area, and acted as a catalyst for community development and economic growth. Why do people go there? Why do people go to uh, Rickwood? Here are some comments from visitors that they put on their really good website. I, I urge you to go to the website if you have a chance. Um, I visit Rickwood. This is one, one of the comments. I visit Rickwood every time I come back to Birmingham, and I love the atmosphere of this classic ballpark and the history that it holds. It's truly a time capsule. Walking into those gates and seeing the field of dreams is truly remarkable. Here's another one. A very nice, nostalgic place. Rickwood reminds me of my hometown Tiger Stadium in Detroit, which is almost completely gone now. I hope Rickwood Field will always be there for young and old to admire. One last one. I found Rickwood for the first time this past Monday while visiting Alabama and am simply blown away by the purity and simplicity of the place. It's like stepping back in time. I roamed around the park with my camera for over an hour, free to follow the light and shadows, and took some of the best images I've ever taken. Um, thanks, Rickwood. Thanks, Birmingham, for getting this place right. What a gem. I think we can attract people like that to Eugene if we rehabilitate Civic Stadium. Thanks very much. Thank you. Alan Beck is next. My name is Alan Beck. I'm a, a friendly emissary from Springfield. Uh, and I'm here to uh, talk about Civic Stadium a little bit. Um, it, it's certainly no news to you that the decisions you make, the actions you take, the decisions you don't make, and the actions you don't take uh, define your stewardship and your leadership. So I think it's fair to say that you guys are in the signal sending business. And I think it's time for you to send a signal. I find it would be very discomforting for decisions to be made about Civic Stadium without your signal sending. So what is your signal for sustainability, historical preservation, neighborhood livability, economic development and jobs, and for tourism? Send the signal. Thank you. Thank you. And now briefly back to goats. Julie, Julia Sarah, and then we go to Bob Maturani. I'm Julia Sarah from the 6th District. My reasons for wanting Nigerian goats are many. The following are just a few. First, as a property owner, I should have the freedom to do so as long as I am not causing harm to others. I honestly do not see how miniature goats are going to be more intrusive than the dogs in my neighborhoods that are double the size, bark constantly, and intimidate, leaving messes behind. Second, we are Eugene. We pride ourselves on being sustainable. Our slogans go green, keep it local. You can't get any more local than your own backyard. How is driving all over town to buy dairy products in plastic tubs and wrappers and jugs carried home in plastic bags green and sustainable? Third, I want the assurance of knowing where all of my food comes from. I want a clean food supply for my children. 
from dairy to spinach recalls the food supply is far riskier than me harvesting food from my own yard and animals. I already take the time to organic garden, raise hens organically. Raising goats is a reasonable next step. Presently, we are forced to support factory farming for some of our dairy product needs. I don't want my money supporting less than ethical practices. Rising food and gas prices are another concern as well. Most of all, I want me and my family to reap the rewards of self-sufficiency and raising our own food in the city. Fourth, I have spoke with almost every person on my street along as well as the street behind me. Um, everyone was more than supportive. Many were shocked that we can't even have them. Others were excited. Some said they personally do not want goats but felt they have no right to keep me from owning them on my own property. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bob Macaroni, you're the last one up tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Mascheroni, and I'm not sure if I should worry now that the uh, mayor actually knows how to say my name, if mm -hmm. that's good or bad. Um, <clears throat> I think I learned an awful lot about goats tonight, and the only thing I'm disappointed with is somebody made a disparaging remark about my dog. So uh, <clears throat> I just have dog and fish, and I understand that uh, goats might not be bad neighbors. So thank you. Um, I'm obviously here on uh, LTD issues, uh, EMX in particular. Um, I'd like to thank all the counselors that took the information in that we provided and actually considered it and made a uh, informed decision after they got all the information rather than stayed with not listening to what the public input really was. Um, you notice that now in the city we have a lot of people that are opposed to this and we we've, we've felt that we've been minimized over the the uh, entire time period but we're gaining a lot of momentum there's a lot of people that are starting to chime in from other corridors that are planned Coburg and River Road and 99 and they're starting to assist us with a battle and it's been a battle from a small grassroots organization and I know that there's insinuations that oh somebody must be funding you guys because you can't possibly do this this is what happens when people strongly believe in an issue um, you have to admit that since LTD had a three and a half year and three million dollar head start we've made a lot of ground up I don't believe EMX is viable anymore I think their own numbers prove that it's impossible for them to operate it with the corridor that you've now picked. Um, I have sent you some more charts, which I'm sure you probably didn't get to because it was late in the day. Uh, it's going to cost $11.5 million to operate EMX on this corridor it, until uh, 2031. That's, that's money they don't have. They've been relying on uh, 3.2 million dollars from the federal government for operating expenses the last few years. They can't continue to spend at a deficit rate. A million dollars, they were three million short when they had to cut 20 percent of the basic bus service. Another million dollars to drive a, a four and a half mile corridor wouldn't make sense. Um, it's not like we don't have bus service in this corridor, we do. And so some people seem to forget that we already run forty million dollars worth of buses in this community. Uh, going to boarding numbers, the MX on University does six thousand boardings a day. Uh, those other numbers, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's going to um, end our forum for today. Um, we just thank everybody for coming, and um, I actually, sorry that Zoe left, and uh, Mary and her sons, and all the uh, folks who taught us tonight about goats, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for those who came about Civic and MX, and uh, I just want to say around the goat, I had a couple goats named Sally and Fred who had, um, a few years back, and I want to say that the one quality that I remember about goats is their inquisitiveness. Their, they, uh, they are the most curious of animals, and uh, very fun to be around for that for that reason. So thank you all. And I've got in the queue here, uh, Councillor Farr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, refreshing interlude about goats. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm very interested in uh, food sustainability and uh, and the 
prospects of raising food in, in individual families. So thank you for the information. Thanks for some very detailed information, including uh, some suggestions for moving forward. Thank you. Councillor Ortiz. Yeah, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's, um, it's always fun when children come down and, and share their thoughts with us. I look at them as a future for tomorrow and hope mm -hmm. that someday that they'll consider sitting up here. Mm -hmm. um, I personally wouldn't mind reviewing the ordinance to see what we can do about um, allowing goats um, on smaller lots. I just have to say that I had goats when I was growing up, but we didn't milk them. We used them to eat, and they were very tasty. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for coming down and talking to us tonight, uh, especially the people to talk about the goats. I really look forward to our work session, which I'm sure we'll have and we'll address the situation and we'll try to come up with a very good lot size, a very reasonable, drop it way, way down from what it is now. Seems unreasonable. And we'll come up with a better solution that will allow everyone to keep two or three goats in their backyard if they want to. I also want to thank the people that came to speak about Civic Stadium. I personally think it would be tragic to let that be torn down and replaced with retail establishment or anything else besides Civic. I think there are perhaps combina various combinations that we haven't looked at yet. I think the city does still have a role with our moral authority. We, we I believe that we can still work out a compromise solution and save Civic. It would really be terrible to let that uh, venerable landmark go by the wayside, I think. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Zelenka. I, too, would like to see us have a work session on goats. I thought that the uh, public testimony, especially jams, was excellent and uh, persuasive. Thanks. Okay, thank you all again. We're going to move on now. And um, Councillor Farr, you are in the queue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've uh, indicated to the Council that I uh, have a motion prepared to reconsider the Council's action from March 9th, which was a 5-4 to four vote, proposing a no-build option for the West Eugene MX expansion. Uh, the intention of that motion has been to clarify the Council's role in providing input regarding the eventual build-out of the project using the 6th and 7th Avenue approach. Um, prior to making the motion, Mayor, I would mm -hmm. like to ask a question of the City Attorney, if I may. Mm -hmm. Please do. Um, City Attorney, assuming the Council action to date remains status quo, can the Council in the near future give notice to LTD that the that uh, the council would like to weigh in regarding ongoing support of the project, for instance, uh, subsequent uh, results from the environmental study that is proposed. Um, yes, as long as you do it, as long as the council does that um, before LTD takes um, some final type of action. So one option for the council, um, given the nature of your decision last week, is a motion to reconsider. But because of the nature of that motion, it wasn't adopting an ordinance, it wasn't approving something that requires a legal action to undo, the Council also has the ability um, to, in essence, amend that rather than just doing a motion to reconsider. So you don't have to take action tonight. You could do something on Wednesday. You could do something after the break to, in essence, clarify that what you did last week was based on the information that you had available at that time and that if additional information came to you, you could say, here's what we think LTD based on that additional information. And consequently, the motion will, uh, the council will have opportunities to provide input to LTD as we move forward with the, with the uh, ongoing uh, MX project? Um, I don't know whether LTD is going to specifically ask the council for additional input. That I just don't know, but if the council chooses to provide additional input um, before LTD makes a final decision, you certainly can do that. And we're not particularly shy, are we? So, uh, Mayor, given that clarification by the, by the city attorney, I will choose at this point to not place the motion on the table. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on then to the uh, consent calendar. And as I understand it, Councillor uh, Zelenka would like to pull E and F. Is that correct, Councillor Zelenka? Um, anybody else want to pull any, any 
anything else from the Mayor, consent I'd like, code? To, I'd like to pull D just so that we could share the good work that we do in the city. Which one? D. D? Okay. All right. So uh, that leaves A, B, and C. And uh, are you please vote on uh, A, B, and C, the consent we need to put a motion on the table, don't we? Except George. It's not me. No, that's um, right. Sorry. I move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded. Please vote. Got you in habit there, didn't Yeah, I did. Seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. And I should mention that uh, Councillor Taylor is out of town. That's why she's not here. All right. We'll start with uh, G, and that would be Councillor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, have, I see staff's available, so if you could just uh, just real quickly go over the four matching grants that have been put forward for our approval. Certainly. Thank you. And thank you for pulling the, this item. Um, we have four programs or four projects that were um, recommended for approval by the Department Advisory Committee. We have the 2011 Strategic Planning Initiative from Skinner City Farm. We have the South University Multimodal Traffic Study from South University Neighbors. We have the Flow Through Worm Bin Prototype that was submitted by Amazon Neighbors. And we have the West 8th Collaborative that's in Downtown Neighborhood Association. It's a collaboration between uh, several businesses and agencies for safety improvements along uh, West 8th. And uh, could you explain just a little bit what the program is? Oh, the neighborhood the matching, matching grants. Neighborhood matching grants is a program where we, it, the, the intent and the goal of the program is to build community. Um, the outcome is um, sort of secondary. Um, it's to support projects, neighborhood um, improvements. It could be an art project, community gardens. This year we had two planning initiatives that were submitted for neighborhood matching grant funding. And it's, um, it's a true match. So the city mm -hmm. provides some seed money. Mm -hmm. And the neighborhood group, um, and it can be a neighborhood association, it can be um, a, uh, an agency working in conjunction with the neighborhood association or an ad hoc group of neighbors that get together and seek improvements in their local neighborhood. And they provide the sweat equity and donations um, to support the project in an, an, an amount that's equivalent to the grant ask and most of the projects actually exceed the ask, that what they donate is, exceeds the ask. Thank you. So River Road and Santa Clara are doing their, are, are doing a process that's similar to SNAPs, but I didn't notice that they were here. Right. And that is a SNAP. They're doing a SNAP process. They're doing, so they're doing this code. Or okay. Strategic Neighborhood Assessment and Planning Program. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, Councilor Linke, you want to speak to this? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that I'm familiar with the, uh, the uh, South University neighborhood one, but I think they're all really good programs. Were there any, and, and I support all of them, were there any that applied that didn't get? There weren't. We have, we went through uh, the last cycle and this cycle, we went through sort of a new process where we required all applicants to go through a pre-review process. Uh, we had seven applications submitted for pre-review, and at the last minute, three um, project applicants decided to pull their applications this year for a variety of reasons. So we had four final applicants, and all were recommended for funding. Mm -hmm. And they all have to get approval by their neighborhood association? Correct. In order Correct. to be forwarded to you guys. And what's the total budget for the matching grant program? We had um, a budget of $50,000, and the mm -hmm. ask came through at 32000 Mm-hmm. And next year, expectation, is it the same? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you. What's the, what are the boundaries associated with the West 8th Collaborative Project? It is, I could pull it up. Um, it is the, it includes the wow hall, the dining room, um, the liquor store, and metro housing. There's also a, a project right there by the Vintage Restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, safety lights, um, some improvements in the right of way, some plants, um, plants to help people keep people out of the planting strip, um, a protective fence around one of the heritage trees, um, and it's. It, I mean, it, it involves all the businesses and all the the groups right down there on that. It's about two blocks. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to vote on that one. Would you vote on that one, please? 
Seven in favor, none in opposition. It passes. And now we go to E. Councillor Zelenka. Yeah, if we could pull together E and F, they're, they're related. They're both EWEB bonds. One's for um, $25 million for water bonds. The other one is a $36 million um, refinancing. And uh, it, it, there's someone from EWEB here. Um, if, if EWEB could come and explain what these are, what the benefits are, and, and what the projects on the water side, the refinancing one obviously doesn't have any projects. but. Sure. My name is Kathy Bloom. I'm the Financial Services Manager for EWEB, and I'm here asking for authorization for these two resolutions, particularly for the water utility. Majority of these relate to additions to our water filtration plant. There are some upgrades to pump stations, and there's also some uh, storage and flow improvements to our reservoirs. So earlier in today, I think you received some detail on exactly what areas those are. So we're the... Are most of these projects um, just needed capital, infrastructure, maintenance, kind of O&M projects? Exactly. We consider these our rebuilding or expansion projects. Are any of them new projects? No, they're, they're projects that have basically been in our five to ten year capital plan. Okay. And then what's the expected benefit from the um, refinancing? The refinancing relates to bonds for our electric utility, and basically we expect anywhere from $1.4 million in savings from those, kind of like refinancing your home. Right. Lower. So it's getting a lower rate. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's all uh, the questions I had. Um, I just wanted to bring those out because they're both large ticket items. One's $36 million and one is um, $25 million. And, uh, my preference is not to have things of that nature, of that large of a magnitude, in the consent calendar. And um, in the future, I tend to pull them out if they are. Uh, I think they merit a little more scrutiny and a little bit more information than, than we normally get within a consent calendar. Um, having said all that, I support both of these. I just want to say I, I appreciate you pulling those counselors and link. I think something of that amount uh, does deserve some scrutiny and some questions about it. And public should know, so appreciate that. All right, I think we're ready to vote on E and F. Which Mayor, yes, if I could ask you to vote separately because these are bond resolutions, you should record each And we vote. put them on the and we, they're all on the table. They're on the okay. table. So the first motion that's on the table is resolution 5026, which is the sale of the electric utility system revenue bond. Okay, would you vote on Resolution 5026? Seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. And now we're going to vote on Resolution 5027. Correct, which is the Water Utility System Bond. Seven in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Now we've completed the consent calendar items. Going to go next to the ratification of our Intergovernmental Relations Committee actions and action on non-unanimous IGR actions from March 3rd and March 9th. Brenda. Mayor. Good evening, Mayor Kersey and members of the Council. Uh, Brenda Wilson, Intergovernmental Relations Manager. And tonight we just have one bill up for your consideration. That would be House Bill 3184. And House Bill 3184, introduced on behalf of the Oregon Association of Broadcasters, would expand the list of media that a legal notice could be published in, from just newspapers to radio, television, and online websites, as long as those online websites were managed by the Oregon Association of Broadcasters. Uh, the IGR committee took this up on March 3rd. Uh, it was a two-to-one vote with Councillor Taylor, and I know she's not here, but she was concerned that while this is permissive and provides more flexibility to local governments, that some local governments may choose just to post those legal notices online. And she was concerned that people without computers wouldn't get those legal notices. Um, uh, Councillor Clark believed that these were additional options for local governments and did not vote in favor of that. So this bill is before you tonight for discussion. Okay, you want to put the motion on the table? Well, I have a question first. I have a question. Uh, There's more questions. Well, Go ahead and put it on the table. Then. Okay. Um, I move. I move. House Bill 3184. Uh, I move to approve um, House to Bill to ratify the IGR committee's vote on House Bill 3184. Second. 
Moved and seconded. And now we've got you want you can go and then I'll call on uh, Councillor Clark. Okay. Um, so this, this bill would allow, in other words, the city, if, if they want to do a legal notice, they wouldn't have to do it in the paper anymore, the paper of record, the register guard. They could just put it on the website, and that would be the only place it would be posted. Mayor Piercy, Councillor Brown, that's correct. Yeah, I, I think I kind of agree with Betty on this one. Um, I think that's – I can see doing both, but I can't see doing just one on the website. There's lots of people that don't have computers, and so I – I, I you agree. think that I will yeah. uh, not agree with this one. Councilor Clark. I uh, was in favor of supporting the staff's position on this, which was priority three support for a number of reasons. One, the cost of doing so is substantially less to the city. Number two, the websites that we're discussing are publicly available and in all cases sponsored by members of the press, so it's places that people typically go to find news in the first place. And in the third place, there are a number of small towns in Oregon that don't have newspapers anymore and they don't have any choice. I mean, you look at a place like Drain, for example, where my friend Sue puts out the Drain Enterprise, and I don't know how much longer they'll put that out in print before they have to go entirely to an online version because the economics don't allow them to produce a newspaper anymore. But there are plenty of small towns in Oregon that have that problem right now, and they're stuck in a place where they can't provide legal notices without a newspaper. So my reason for priority three support was to give those towns that capacity, but because I also would like to see us moving more efficiently and less expensively with our work. Councilor Zelenka. Brenda, could you tell me the what the current law says? It says basically well, you tell me. Mayor Piercy, Councilor Zelenka, basically a legal notice needs to be published in a paper, and there are certain provisions about, you know, the circulation of that paper and um, for the public entity that's doing the publication of the notification to make some determinations about um, the best way to get that public notice out. What this particular bill would do would give public agencies the flexibility to determine wh what is the best way to get that notification out. It doesn't prevent you from putting them in all four media, uh, newspaper, radio, television, and online. Uh, that's a local decision that could be made. But it does give you the option to do that. Um, as Councillor Clark was saying, for those uh, towns that don't have newspapers, they still need to make a decision now what sort of publication they're going to place their legal notice in. So this would, in essence, create a statewide posted website from the association or stations of broadcasters and it would be a statewide website how how does that work mayor Percy councillors Lunk it can be any website as long as that website is managed by the Oregon Association of broadcasters um, so if there are um, I know many of the local and state, yeah, television stations have websites those websites would be eligible to accept legal notices um, uh, posting a legal notice on our website would not comply with uh, this bill. So managed by the association, but let's say KMTAR, KZI, or KVAL, they all have websites, but they're managed by those entities, not the association. It's my understanding that they have to be, that the association, the Oregon Association of Broadcasters includes those. Uh, um, or their members. Right. A television station licensed for commercial operation by the Federal Communications uh, Commission. So, yes, by their members. This is um, a bill that is aimed uh, to take away legal notification uh, from newspapers and bring it into radio, television, and uh, online media. I, I believe that the uh, newspaper associations will be fighting this bill. Yeah, I was about to comment on that. <laughs> I would think that the newspapers don't like this bill at all. Um, and, and I'm worried about our newspaper and our, our local register guard. I'm sure they count on legal notices as a, as a, a bit of revenue, and I'm worried about their declining subscriptions. Um, uh, and while I also understand we're moving in a, in a different way almost all young people get their media 
off of the web as opposed to picking up and using the ritual of a newspaper. Um, uh, so I'm kind of a bit on the fence here. Uh, so I'm going to support the, the uh, IGR committee vote of monitor. Councillor Cryer. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting one because through this particular motion, we're having the conversation about what is the nature of communication and what is the best way to reach people. And, uh, and I think, interestingly enough, this is really a conversation about um, increasing the ability for people to have access to notice, uh, particularly timely notice. Um, the thing I'm conscious of is this, this isn't taking away the ability for newspapers to have notices. I think the key, and I think you may have mentioned it, is it's taking away the exclusive element of newspapers being the source. And as we move into a new age, we, able, we need to be able to integrate other things as official ways of communicating information to folks. Because as Councillor Zelenka said, um, websites, uh, television stations, radio stations, I know when I want information on snow days or school closures or emergency situations, I go to the web and all the radio and TV stations go to the web. That's where they get their information. So it's possible that by um, not taking away the ability to put it into a newspaper, but removing the exclusivity of newspapers, you can dramatically increase the ability for people to find out information about meetings. It's where the world is going. And I don't want to hurt newspapers, but I need to recognize that a lot of people have gravitated away from newspapers to other sources. And this, I think, is a way for us to try to take that into account. And so I will, I'll, I'll support the staff's position on it um, because I don't want to go, instead of newspapers, I just want to broaden where we can go with all of this important information and increase to match a new age. Councilor Poling. <clears throat> I believe that uh, Councilors Clark, Zelenka, and Pryor have made all the points that I was going to make. Uh, I do have a little bit of uh, a question, though. There seems to be a little bit of confusion on whether or not we're voting to uh, monitor or support this. I haven't so made if that I can get some monitor. clarification on it. Major committees monitor. Mayor Piercy, Councilor Polling, there was a motion to monitor this bill. Mm -hmm. and that motion failed because it, uh, the vote failed because it was not unanimous. So then the vote that we're going to vote on tonight basically would say that we're he moved monitor uh, monitor okay all right thank you he moved monitor and i'm about to he moved to he he moved to support the prevailing opinion in igr in igr mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. two to one vote which was monitor right. so that's what it is okay mm -hmm. councillor ortiz um, so I would hope that somebody makes an, a motion to support because I think that this is one of those obligations that we have to look at into the future. And I think that a lot of my count, my peers have said that you know this is people get their media in different ways, and this isn't um, specifically saying what we're going to do. But um, if this passes and if this becomes legislation for the state, I would hope that the city of Eugene or the counselors would take into account that we still want our stuff in news media and newspaper. <laughs> Councilor Farr. Thank you, Mayor. Just a clarification that by voting in favor of moving this forward, it doesn't necessarily indicate a agreement or disagreement with the motion, with the, uh, with the actual bill before the legislature. Well, just to clarify, when the majority of people on this council vote in a way that is the city's that is the city's point of view that will go to the legislature and guide Brenda's work and that is what people will hear is the position of the city of Eugene thank you mayor my my comment was intended to uh, discuss my personal commitment one way or the other not the city's commitment okay councillor Clark I'll uh move to substitute for uh, support priority three and speak to it if I get a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Okay. The, one of the things that's been, oh, I don't know how to describe it, drilled into me maybe uh, as the uh, importance of local control as a, an issue that the 
city strives to <coughs> uh, support at the legislature, and I believe this does exactly that. It allows each individual community the chance to make the decision appropriate to their community, and like Councillor Pryor said, allows them the capacity to do it rather than uh, remaining with the restriction that they have to do it in a newspaper, even if their town doesn't have a newspaper. So I hope you'll support that. Okay, so now the mo the, uh, mo the substitute motion is before you. Councilor Zelenka. I was going to comment on what Councilor Pryor said, and I don't disagree with that, except for this legislation doesn't say and newspapers and websites. It says or. And the or is very telling here. That would almost assuredly wipe out all newspaper notices, I think. I think newspaper notices would go completely by the wayside within a matter of months ha if this legislation passes. Maybe so I think uh, Brenda has. We'll that's how it's written here. Is Mayor, that correct? Mayor Piercy, Councilor Zelenka, yes, that's how it's written. I do not believe that that is the intention, however. Well, yeah, well, who proposed it? <laughs> <laughs> the best intentions. Um, so in, in my mind, the fact that it says or is substantially different than what you were talking about, Chris. If what you were talking about were what the proposal said and it, and it added that as an option, uh, I think that would, be okay, uh, that would be acceptable to me. But because it says or, I think that almost all of it will become website-based and we won't see any uh, publications in newspapers. Just for the mere fact that it's easier and cheaper. It just depends if you want more. Even though there's lots of people that only get their Thank you. those mm -hmm. uh, uh, their information through a newspaper. Is that a friendly to change it to if 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 amended to and? I could make that friendly. Huh. That I would if it were an and we could support it. So accepted. Yeah, because I was going to do that. And your second accepted that. <laughs> Okay. All right. I would ask for a clarification on that. Um, if we put an and between all of them, then that would assume that the notification would have to be placed in a newspaper and on the radio and on television and on the website. Friendly but removed. it's my understanding that's not your intention, no, correct? Well, my friendly was just to put an and after website or before websites. So that So right now it's currently newspaper or broadcast uh, radio television or radio, right? Right. So that would With stay the, the same being that it would be an and websites. That raises a question for me. Can I ask a clarification on that? But it feels like right now you have to post it in the newspaper and you can put it wherever else you want. And so what you're suggesting is we just modify that or require it I can't accept that friendly. It's still say this, ex the existing law says uh, newspaper, radio, or television, or one of those three, and then this adds or websites, which means I think everything will migrate to websites. So I'm saying leave the first part the same and say and websites. So it goes on to the websites as well. I, I'm declining the friendly. Okay. Okay, so we're back to the substitute motion. And Councilor Pryor, you want to speak to that? Only just briefly to say that I appreciate where Councilor Zilink mm -hmm. is going. I, I absolutely do. I don't want to cripple newspapers. But on the other hand, it's not our responsibility to support newspapers. Um, and with that said, I would hope that newspapers would still be a part of the communication strategy because there is a large segment that still reads newspapers and doesn't go to the web. Absolutely true. But what I don't want to do is to say you still have to have newspapers just like the old rule was, and now we've added all this other stuff on top of it. So I guess the, to me the core thing is flexibility, but hopefully people will be smart about that and recognize that some segments use this media and some segments use this media, and we really should use the ones that reach the broadest possible audience. So I, would, I wouldn't want to require newspapers, but I would expect that good public notification incorporates newspapers because they reach a certain audience others don't. I know I can't guarantee that and I can't make them do that, but that would be what I would hope. Mm -hmm. Councilor Clark, do you want to speak to that? 
No, I think we've probably beat this horse too much here at this point. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor Farr, you speak to it? Thank you. Just a, a clarification. In, if we were to change the wording, then certainly the legislature would change their wording, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I Mayor Pierce, Councillor Farr, you know that better than I. But uh, um, as long as your intention is clear um, that, the, that what this bill is trying to do with the or language is that uh, saying that if you publish in any of these media, you have satisfied the legal notification requirement. The local government, the public entity gets to choose. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. My, my point being that uh, Gerard and Huffman aren't likely to listen to us and change it from mm -hmm. and to or. Thank you. <laughs> Counts on how persuasive you would like me to be. <laughs> well, for that matter, or, or anything we say, then <laughs> IGR is irrelevant. Um, well, I'll put you on the spot, Mr. City Manager. So if you have a budget crunch and you're several million dollars in the hole and you have the discretion to not do public notices in the newspaper and spend thousands of dollars doing it, as we have for the last 20 years, are you still <laughs> going to do that? <laughs> I'll answer for you. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think most jurisdictions will and won't. And we're seeing um, uh, budget crunches at local governments all over the place, and, and people are looking to cut everything they can that's discretionary, and I think this is going to be one of the first places they look. If it meets the letter of the law, and you can put it on a website, and it costs you zero, it doesn't cost that's going to happen. It's all about no. Councilor Clark. I saw a conversation recently amongst our Board of County Commissioners on this very subject. And one of the things they brought up were the different levels of types of public announcement. There are, there are certain sorts that have certain requirements and other sorts that have other requirements. So my question is about the applicability of this particular bill. Does it apply to all manner of public notices in all forms or the discretionary ones and still requires others to be in paper? Where, where does it fall in that regard? Uh, Mayor Piercy, Councilor Clark, it only applies to a limited number of public notices. Those public notices, I would imagine, that don't include public hearings or other types of legal notices. Um, and I apologize. It's I didn't. It would it this, be fair to characterize them as minor public notices? The bill refer, refers to them as short public notices, but they are public notices as defined in ORS 174-104. I see. Yeah. I, I, my recollection of the conversation I heard is there are certain requirements around the ones that are likely to generate the largest number of potential um, respondents or, or, or those with the highest degree of interest <coughs> still have some, some higher degree of, 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 uh, of priority and, and interest around them. Uh, Mayor Piercy, Councilor Clark, the way this bill is written, again, the local, uh, the public entity could decide um, for itself which of the media uh, was best suited for a particular with type those, of notice. With those minor ones, they'd have some local control. Okay, I'll support that. Councillor Farr. Just for the record, the RGR committee is, uh, does have consequence, and your work in Salem <laughs> is definitely <laughs> <known as>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayor Piercy, Councillor Farr, thank you. That makes it easier for me to go up there every single day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now you're going to vote on the substitute motion, which, you, which is to support. Five in favor and two in opposition, it passes. And then we go back to the whole thing. So you have to put the whole thing on the table. Okay. Um, well, wait, here. don't we need to vote on this particular we one did. and then go back to the main motion? Since we know we just voted on the amendment. Oh, we need to Okay. Now we have to vote on the regular. The main motion? All right. This one has a main motion. Okay. Back to the main motion. Would you please vote on the main motion? Clarify the main motion. So, everybody's talking, but what they're saying is do we have to vote on this particular one before we vote on the general one? Yes. So, that's what we're doing. So, we're voting on this specific one at, as substituted, right? Yes. Reconstruct the motion. Right. All right. Yes. So please vote. So it's five in favor and two in opposition. It passes. And now 
This one. Down. Here, George. Yeah. Yeah. It's at yeah. the end. Has it's it right is. here. No, this. The regular IGR motion. The, the regular one. The suggested the motion. motion. Yeah. Microphone. Yeah. yeah, the whole. Microphone. There you go. I move to ratify the IG, IGR committee's unanimous actions on bills and approval of staff recommendations in the March 3 and March 9, 2011 IGR bill reports for bills not pulled for discussion at those IGR meetings. Moved. Second. And seconded. Seeing no further discussion, will you please vote on that? Aye, aye. All right. Seven in favor, none in opposition. It passes. Thank you very much. Um, so next action item number four, an ordinance adopting hazardous substance user fees. Council President? I move to adopt Council Bill 5044, adopting hazardous substance user fees for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2011. Second. Moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion. Well, Councilor Zelenka? I just wanted to point out that in the um, agenda item summary it says the recommended fee of 5334 is slightly lower than last year's fee of 5548 due to lower staffing costs so this is actually a reduction in rates yes. okay ready to vote please do six in favor and one in opposition it passes thank you thank you for waiting for such a long time all right uh, the final action of the evening is the appointment to the sustainability commission I move to appoint Art Farley to position two on the Sustainability Commission, filling the unexpired term of Mark Nystrom, ending on June 30th, 2013. Moved. Second. And seconded. No one's in the queue. Please vote. Seven in favor and none in opposition. So congratulations to Art Farley. And with that, we are finished with the business of the evening. Thank you all. <laughs>